Welcome everybody. Um, good morning. Uh, welcome to our in-house in focus session and today's session is all going to be about crisis management and insurance and this is the COVID-19 special edition. Um, I'm Neil Howes. Uh, I'm a partner at Mills and Reeve in the insurance disputes group. And um, what we do is we act for a lot of major insurers and other clients in the insurance sector. And we also act for businesses like yours. So what we do is when businesses face claims, um, we act for you and we act for your insurers to help you defend those claims and manage them through to a successful resolution. Um, and we have specialists across the firm who have kind of expertise in all of the different types of claims that we're gonna be covering today. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we start. Firstly, um, this is my first large scale webinar. Um, I'm hoping it all runs smoothly, but please bear with us um, if it doesn't. Um, I recorded some content for, for something to be published a couple of weeks ago on my iPhone. I thought I'd done a pretty good job of it, and then I watched it back, um, and it looked like I was a hostage chained to a radiator. So um, apologies in advance um, if that's how I'm coming across today. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you'll also see that we've got a little Q&A box. What I'm going to suggest um, is that we deal with questions at the end, um, but as you're going along, if you've got a question, then do feel free to put it in that Q&A box and we'll try to work through as many as we can um, at the end of the session. Um, so let's make a start. What are we going to be looking at today? Um, we're going to have a look at some of the types of claims that your organisation may end up facing as a result of the COVID crisis. We're gonna look at some of the key types of insurance policies that your business probably already has in place to help you cover some of those risks. Um, as we go along, we're gonna uh, be doing a little bit of explanation about how some of those policies work. We're gonna tackle the hot topic of business interruption insurance and COVID, and we're gonna finish um, with some best practice tips. Um, I was thinking the other day about um, this year and uh, some friends of ours and uh, our family went away for New Year. And little did I know that January the 1st was probably as good as 2020 was going to get. Um, and it's fair to say that the world around us has changed completely since then in ways that most of us at the beginning of this year couldn't even possibly co comprehend. And um, as a result, every business is facing enormous challenges at the moment, and those challenges inevitably bring with them risks. So I've kind of highlighted on this slide some of the types of claims that we think are going to start coming out of COVID. Everything from personal injury claims, claims against directors, prof neg claims, um, I've highlighted business interruption losses, problems with supply chains, right through to the increased risks of things like cyber attacks, employee fraud, and with those, of course, regulatory actions. You'll have probably seen from the news yesterday that EasyJet had to um, issue a public statement because it's been the victim of a data protection breach that's affecting 9 million customers. So for obvious reasons, we're not gonna have time today to look at all of those areas. We're just gonna focus on a few. Um, because the good news is that for most of these risks that I've highlighted, you probably have insurance to help you with them. So we're going to touch on business interruption um, cover, which is a hot topic and a very contentious one at the moment. Um, on a more positive note, we're going to touch on personal injury claims and our views about that. We're going to have a look at increased risk for directors and officers and also employment practice claims as well. But let's start then with the one that's been grabbing the most media attention over the past few weeks, and that's business interruption. A lot of media coverage on this um, over the last month or so. You may well have also seen in your news feeds that the Financial Conduct Authority, the FCA, is planning on taking a series of test cases to court to get some judicial clarification on what types of policy wording respond in the current crisis and what don't. Um, from what we're hearing, 
the FCA is going to try and have those test cases heard by the court in July. I have to say that given the number of parties involved and the complexity of the, issue, complexity of the issues, um, that timescale looks highly optimistic um, to me, but, but we will wait to see. It's also worth pointing out though that the FCA itself has acknowledged that the vast majority of BI business interruption policies were never intended to and are unlikely to cover financial losses as a result of the current crisis. I'm gonna try in a nutshell to explain why and also really to highlight some of the issues that the courts are going to have to grapple with over the next few months. I'd start then probably by highlighting how BI policies work. So they are effectively a form of cover under which the insurer agrees to pay for lost profit or additional business expenses, which are caused by a specific occurrence listed in the policy, which happens during that policy period. Policy then normally sets out a formula um, for calculating the losses that are recoverable under the policy. So the key point here is this, unless the loss claimed is caused by a specified occurrence in the policy wording, there is no cover for those losses. Why is that proving so controversial in relation to COVID? Well, for a start, most BI cover is written as an add-on to a property damage policy. Okay, so the specified occurrence which triggers the BI cover is the loss of or damage to property. So the BI cover is designed to kick in, for example, if there is a fire or a flood at your premises and that causes your businesses to, to be shut down for a temporary period whilst that is all sorted out. But on the face of it, the COVID virus doesn't cause loss or damage to property. Now, there are some BI policies out there where an infectious or notifiable disease is a specified occurrence under the policy. But the key here is that every policy wording is slightly different, okay? So if you have one of those policies, the question of whether it provides you or may provide you with some BI cover comes down to exactly what the policy terms say. So let me give you some examples and, and some of the issues that the courts are gonna be grappling with. Firstly, I think the courts are gonna be looking at whether COVID is one of the infectious diseases, um, which is a specified occurrence. So some policies will include a, note, a, a list, if you like, of particular diseases. And let's be honest, COVID is unlikely to be amongst them. Some policies in contrast um, include cover for all notifiable diseases, uh, and COVID has been classed as a notifiable disease since I think the 5th of March. Even if the policy has a notifiable disease wording though, the question of cover still comes down to the precise terms um, of the policy. And again, that critical question of whether the specified occurrence has caused the loss claim. So there are gonna be issues that the courts are gonna to have to decide over whether the loss suffered by the business has been caused for example, by an outbreak of COVID actually at the business premises, which may in theory be covered, or by government restrictions and guidance, which is obviously um, the intention of which is to stop the spread of the virus. And those two things and that distinction between the two it is really critical. And there are policies where cover um, uh, applies where there are public authority restrictions arising from notifiable diseases. Um, but depending on the policy wording, that still doesn't mean that COVID losses are covered. So I think in those cases, it may well come down to not only the policy wording, but what the impact on the business has been. So for example, we have some businesses which have been ordered to be shut down as a result of COVID. Others, on the other hand, have chosen to shut down or are simply um, seeing losses as a result of the application of government guidance. Uh, and that second uh, example is unlikely to trigger cover. Understandably as well, there are also gonna be a lot of issues for the courts to decide over whether the loss covered, or at least a significant part of that loss, 
would have been suffered by the business anyway, just as a result of the kind of wider impact that we're seeing from that pandemic. So those are the, the issues that the courts are going to have to grapple with. It is going to be extremely interesting over the next uh, few months to see how the courts approach them. In the meantime, what I'd suggest is if you have business interruption cover and you think you may have a, a valid claim, um, then the best advice is to speak to your insurance broker. So let's move on then um, to a different type of cover um, for which you all have cover because it's a compulsory type of insurance and that's employers liability insurance so um, this is triggered effectively by an injury or illness to an employee which is caused during the policy period and that it covers sums that you may be legally liable to pay to your employees um, for negligence in respect of injury disease illness or death it protects you effectively against personal injury claims although it's worth highlighting that quite a few employers liability policies have quite big excesses on them. Um, so this is still a risk area for your business. Um, what does it cover? Well, it covers damages that you have, might have to pay out, it covers legal costs, um, it covers defence costs as well. And like all um, policies, there will be some exclusions uh, written in there at the same time. So where are we likely to see a rise in personal injury claims against employers as a result of COVID? Um, perhaps I suspect the most obvious area at the moment is centred around PPE. In other words, um, either employers who are failing to provide employees with PPE or there will be allegations that the PPE is inadequate. That is likely to hit the health and the care sectors most certainly as we as things stand at the moment and um, we're also going to see claims i suspect as a result of some employers failing to follow government guidance um, we hear of businesses um, who are for example requiring employees and have been requiring employees to work um, at the business premises when realistically they could have been doing that job from home um, I think the transition back to normal working, whatever normal now looks like, is going to be particularly challenging for employers. It's about getting that balance right, of course, between getting your business back up and running on all cylinders at the same time as making sure that you're balancing that against the, the health and safety risks to your employees. Now, if you follow government guidance, then that's likely to provide you with a defence to a claim for negligence. Um, the difficulty, of course, is that that is easier said than done. Um, the guidance is changing almost on a on a day by day basis at times. Eight sets of guidelines alone were published last week on different types of workplaces, ranging from construction sites right through to offices and at the other end of the spectrum, you know, laboratories and research facilities. Um, the difficulty as well is that, of course, a lot of businesses operate across a range of different premises, which means that you're going to need to be looking at different sets of guidelines, um, all of which may say something slightly different. The other point to mention here is that the guidelines aren't comprehensive. Um, so, for example, the guidelines published last week don't say how often cleaning needs to be carried out. It isn't particularly specific about what safe arrangements for essential face-to-face -face working look like. So employer, employers are gonna need to conduct their own risk assessments and they're being expected by the governments to devise and implement a safe system of work which is tailored to their unique operational requirements. Um, on top of all of that, I think as a result of COVID, we're likely to see a rise in um, personal injury actions which are based on vicarious liability, in other words, errors by your own employees. So we may well see cases where employees can, have been continuing to work, even though they might know that they're symptomatic or infectious. Um, you know, there are businesses who are gonna have managers who either ignore government guidance or don't fully implement it. And of course, in some businesses, we're gonna see staff shortages 
um, leading to other employees being asked to carry out tasks that they may be not properly trained for. And unfortunately, history tells us that's going to result in, in accidents as well. One of the areas, um, again, where I think we're likely to see a rise in claims is in relation to workplace stress. So I was chatting to a colleague of mine about this the other day, and he was saying, actually, over the next few weeks and months, the, 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 the focus is going to be, for a lot of employers, on making sure that you've got the physical um, setup of your business premises right for people to come back in. It's all about looking at physical risk. And workplace stress could end up being the, um, the forgotten piece of the jigsaw. Um, I think we are going to see an increase in workplace stress claims, potentially from uh, people, for example, who are too afraid to come back to work or being required to come back to work without proper PPE and precautions being put in place. Homeworking as well has been incredibly challenging for some people and it makes it extremely difficult for employers to keep in touch and keep um, on top of things with their employees to make sure they're being properly supported. I think certainly where we're looking at cases where the allegations are likely to be that you um, you caused me to get the virus or you exposed me to the virus, causation is going to be a huge battleground in these cases. It is going to be extremely difficult, I think, for claimants, but not necessarily impossible um, to show that an employer's breach um, has directly led to their contraction of the virus um, because the, the virus is obviously so widespread and of course people can carry it um, without showing any symptoms. I say not impossible because history tells us um, through the court's approach to things like asbestosis and mesothelioma that the courts do have a track record of finding a way through the thorny path of causation um, where they feel that employers have been at fault. So in terms of risk management for your businesses, it really is all about risk assessment, particularly in this transition phase back to, to, to normal working. And it's about documenting what you're doing so that you can explain if you later need to the rationale for the decisions and the factors that you, that you took into account. So moving on then, I wanted to talk to you about a type of cover that you may not even know that you have. Most businesses do, and it's probably tucked away in the back of a filing cabinet somewhere, but it's an incredibly useful insurance policy for a business to have, and that's what's called DNO, Directors and Officers um, Insurance. It's also sometimes called corporate legal insurance, or it has a corporate legal add-on element to it. Let me just explain what it does, is it provides cover for your directors, your officers, and in most cases also your businesses themselves against a whole range of third party claims that might be made against you um, that might not otherwise be picked up by other policies. So it covers most regulatory actions, for example, it can cover claims against directors by shareholders, um, it even covers things like defamation. Um, and other things like that as well. Um, it is what's called a claims made policy. In other words, the policy only responds if a claim has been notified or a circumstance that might give rise to a claim has been notified during the policy period. The thing that you've got to be wary of here is the fact that most policies also exclude cover for anything that should have been notified in earlier years. And so there are situations where if you're not careful, you could find yourself in a situation where you haven't notified something this year, and by the time you get to notify it, you're in a new policy year, and you're caught by an exclusion for cover. So it is some, most insurers will take a sensible and entirely pragmatic view of that, but it is something to be, to be conscious of. What does it cover you for? Well, it covers you for damages, for financial loss that the business might have to pay out, legal costs, defence costs, civil fines, regulatory penalties. Some DNO policies even go so far as to provide cover for mitigation costs in order to manage business crises and PR costs as well. So it's a really useful policy to have. It obviously comes with some exclusions. Um, 
those tend to be centered around things that would be picked up by other policies that you're likely to have. So for example, professional negligence claims, you would normally have a separate prof neg policy. Bodily injury, that's gonna be covered under your employer's liability, employment practices, and so on. I've mentioned on that slide, insured versus insured actions. Uh, what I mean by that is that some policies um, will not cover claims which are made by the company itself against one of its own directors, but that depends on the policy wording. So some policies do cover that type of claim if the company is bringing a claim against one of its personal, its own directors for damages. Where are we likely then to see uh, an impact from COVID? Well, this is where it gets quite interesting, I think, at the moment. Um, and quite a lot of stuff going on in the United States, which I, I think gives us some indication as to what we might be hit by here. Um, I've mentioned derivative actions by shareholders. Normally, if a, if a director has done something wrong, then it, it is obviously um, the, the company uh, that has the claim against it. There are situations, though, where the company shareholders can bring claims directly for breaches of directors' duties, which cause loss to the companies. Particularly in smaller companies, therefore, um, we may see shareholders try to bring actions against directors for mismanagement of the COVID crisis. Um, and in, if successful, the director is then required to pay damages back to the company. Um, I realise that um, COVID is an incredibly difficult time for directors and officers at the moment. The fact that it is an incredibly difficult time doesn't absolve directors from complying with their statutory and their fiduciary duties. Good corporate governance um, does still need to come right up at the top of that uh, of your list. Um, it is, though, worth making the point that shareholders can only bring derivative claims with permission from the court. And for various reasons that I won't go into in detail, the test for getting permission is an extremely tough one to pass. Um, so we're only likely to see derivative claims where directors have committed very, very serious breaches of their duties. For example, um, directors transferring assets to themselves or um, things of that nature. So the prevailing view at the moment is that the overall risk of derivative claims for businesses is relatively low, probably greater in smaller family family run companies where shareholder disputes become uh, more common. Where I think we are going to see a rise in claims, though, is claims by investors. We're also already seeing starting to see that in the US. Um, so what I'm talking about here is claims arising from inaccurate or misleading financial and other statements which may have an impact on a company's share price. So I think we may well see claims by investors under Section 90 of the Financial Services and Markets Act for compensation if a company publishes inaccurate or misleading statements in its financial accounts or market announcements. Those claims are not easy to bring. Um, they require the issuer of the statement to either have um, made the statement knowing it to be false or for the issuer to have been reckless as to whether it was right or not. Um, but we are starting to see claims over in the US. Uh, there is, for example, um, a group action um, uh, uh, starting off in the US by a group of investors in Norwegian cruise lines who are alleged to have lied about the impact of the virus and the steps that they were taking to um, prevent the transmission of the virus on board their cruise ships in order to keep bookings up and presumably as well to keep the share price up as well. Um, I've got to mention insolvency and um, the risk of claims by insolvency practitioners because there are going to be business which is, businesses which have already gone to the wall as a result of COVID and if we're hit by a tidal wave of a recession, which we're highly likely to be, um, there are gonna be other businesses that find themselves in insolvency problems as well. How does that affect directors and claims against directors? Well, there are situations obviously where directors can be guilty of wrongful or fraudulent trading um, whilst the company is insolvent and then can um, face personal claims to pay money back into the company. 
Um, back in March, um, the government announced that it was putting a moratorium on the rules regarding wrongful trading. Um, but that moratorium still hasn't been passed into law, um, despite the fact that the proposed moratorium is due to come to an end at the end of this month. Now, to be fair to the government, they have had quite a lot on, um, but it doesn't help the situation that we, we don't at the moment know whether the moratorium is legally binding or not. Um, I was talking to one of our insolvency partners the other day. Um, he expressed concerns that actually um, the moratorium um, may just lull people into a bit of a false sense of security. Um, the government's announcement about that moratorium also said, and I quote, all of the other checks and balances that would help to ensure that directors' duties are properly undertaken will remain in force. And there's a bit of a tension there because nothing therefore, according to that statement, will water down the basic duties owed by a director to ensure that they've got to have um, the best interests of suppliers and creditors in mind at the time when the company is or may be going insolvent. So despite the kind of announced moratorium, um, I still think that there are uh, potentials uh, for directors for, for, uh, to face claims by insolvency practitioners and personal liability. Um, if I'm being honest, I think there will probably also be um, an increase in fraudulent trading claims where directors desperate to save their businesses um, have really done something quite dishonest. And um, what I would say on that is if your business is facing a situation where it may be looking at insolvency difficulties, then you really do need to get some specialist advice um, as soon as possible. On that um, uh, rather uncheery note, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention regulatory actions. Yeah, I think we are going to see um, uh, an increase of regulatory actions. I think um, with COVID being as it is and the disruption it's causing, I think we're going to uh, start to see a rise in data breaches um, and other uh, and regulatory actions on the back of that. Um, the FCA and the PRA have also set out their expectation that firms have contingency plans in place that are effective and proportionate for their businesses. Um, and they're already talking about doing spot checks. So regulatory activity is something that we expect to see on the rise over the next few months and into the future, and inevitably that will result in claims against companies. The good news is, is that those kind of actions are largely or should largely be covered by your DNA policy. Um, so another type of um, optional policy, which a lot of businesses have in place, but not all, is employment practice liability. Um, it kind of does what it says on the tin, so it covers sums that, that you may be legally liable to pay to past or present employees as a result of employment practice violations. Again, it's a claims made policy. In other words, it only responds if a claim is made during the policy period, or alternatively, you've notified a circumstance that might give rise to a claim, and that obviously then later turns into one. I'm now gonna hand over um, to one of our employment partners, Andrew Secker, and he's going to talk about the impact of, uh, of COVID on employment practices. Thanks very much, Neil. If, my de if what's been on my desk is a sign of what's been on your desks over the last nine weeks, I think it's safe to say we've all been pretty busy. But in terms of thinking about the tribunal claims that can be brought by employees, context is absolutely key as ever in thinking about what we're seeing. And although many employers reacted by looking at implementing the mass furloughing of staff, which is layoff with less pay than normally you're contractually entitled to, implementing pay reductions on a temporary or permanent basis, it's safe to say we didn't see the rise of tribunal claims that could be expected had you made those sorts of changes in other circumstances. And that is a combination of a range of factors. So undoubtedly due to some great communication and strong leadership of business, and also the impact of the pandemic on the labor market. But in very much what we're seeing is the initial reaction saw a complete 
uh, alignment of interest between employers and employees in responding to the short term effects. So how can we insulate businesses? Now, what we're seeing from this point onwards is that the interests of employers and employees will increasingly uh, divide. And more so when you're thinking about, for example, changes to the furlough scheme in August, where employers are going to have to contribute to the cost of the furlough wages. I think that's what we've got to bear in mind, that it's that dividing of interest that could see COVID-related employment tribunal claims rise. So I've picked out four areas just to explore, but there are others. Uh, for example, I'm dealing with a rather odd claim for an employee who is claiming that a decision not to furlough them is discriminatory. So there are other things along the edges. So the first type of claim, I think, is what I call dealing with the reluctant returner. Neil's alluded to this already in this session. There will be some individuals that are reluctant to return to work and cite concern about their health and safety in the workplace. There are rights that employees have to refuse to come into work and to be protected from being subjected to a detriment. So, for example, being disciplined or having their pay cut and indeed protections against being dismissed for having a reasonable belief that you, that, that you uh, are in serious and imminent danger in the workplace. And that is the reason you're refusing to come into work. Now, the bit that's really difficult for employers is this. Those claims focus on the reasonable belief of the employee. So there will be scenarios where you've taken all the steps that the government have said you should take in accordance with the guidance and an employee could still reasonably believe that their health and safety is at risk and refuse to come into work. So, for example, if you've not published your risk assessment, if you've got people who are particularly vulnerable or who may have mental health conditions which affect how they perceive the risks in the workplace. And there'll be some organisations which cannot eliminate all risks. So, for example, as Neil alluded to, if you cannot remove the need to make uh, to work face to face. So that's one really difficult challenge. And we're already seeing those sorts of issues come up in, within employers. And, and to give a context of that, all of the employment partners at Mills and Reeve had queries on Monday. The second area is around furloughing. So lots of organisations responded to the pandemic by implementing immediate measures. So the mass furloughing of staff redundancies. Um, we're not really seeing, we saw things like pay cuts. Now, as we move beyond this initial wave to look at the longer term impact, I think we're now seeing employers really think about, OK, what are we going to do to the furlough scheme? Are we only going to furlough people whose jobs are sustainable in the longer term? Now, that's going to have two things. Firstly, it's going to, the impact it's going to have is those new measures you're implementing could trigger claims for, for example, collective redundancy, unfair dismissals. But crucially, you may find yourself having claims in respect of the shorter term measures you implemented previously. So the limitation period for most tribunal claims is three months. So if, for example, you furloughed staff with it using implied consent, it's possible they could go back and say, well, actually, you don't have my express contractual consent to change my pay. So I'm going to bring a claim for unlawful deductions from wages. And this is my point about the divergence of interest between employer and employee is the greater that divide occurs, the more likely you can have people look back at what you've done previously as well as what you're doing now to think about the claims they could bring. The third area is that I think one of the fantastic things that's come out of the a crisis and in fact one of the few fantastic things has been the fact that many organizations became virtual overnight and in doing so broke many of the taboos around remote and flexible working so what that follows is that i think if employers go backwards and, and continue to refuse re requests for flexible working i think you're going to see more disputes because i think it's been proven that in many organizations it's perfectly possible to work flexibly remotely and indeed, I think the challenge for employers is thinking about the framework of flexibility that could really work for you moving forward and concentrating on ensuring flexible working requests are granted within that context. The fourth and final thing I'm just going to cover is really equality. Now, many people have been 
quick to, to point to the government guidance on health and safety, all of which cites issues with equality and say, well, actually, what do we mean by that? Well, there's the simple things. So you need to be thinking about the prospect of I, who you identify to furlough, who is unfurloughed, who is made redundant. All of those things you need considering, do they give rise to either a direct or indirect discrimination risk? But also think about other measures. So with many of the health and safety steps you're going to take on the return to work. So, for example, if you implement rotating teams or if you have to have people work different hours than they are contractually obliged to. Well, those could each have an impact on people as a result of their protected characteristics. So who could work extended hours, take into account childcare responsibilities? So it's really thinking about how those issues could come up because I could see a real rise in equality claims. And again, all of these things are more likely the growing divergence of interests which inevitably comes when employers think about the longer term impacts and take longer term measures like redundancies, pay cuts, changes to terms and conditions. So that's what I think is going to be going to see in the next few months, um, if that's helpful. Um, Neil, back to you. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, we're just going to finish before questions with um, a couple of best practice tips, if my screen will work. There you go. Um, in terms of, these are all focused on managing the risk to your businesses um, through insurance, really. Um, firstly, I've said engage a broker with deep sector knowledge. You know, all, every sector has its different challenges at the moment. Um, and what you really need right now, if you don't already have one, is, is a really good insurance broker who's able to kind of understand the nuances of your business and the, um, and the impact of COVID and the other challenges that you're going through on your specific sector. Um, I think as kind of in-house lawyers, it's a really good idea to do as a minimum, a kind of yearly review of the suite of policies that you've got because your business will have a number of insurance policies, some of which we've touched on today, some of which we haven't, and they will all interlock together in various ways. But if you're one of the people in the business who's, who's responsible for helping the business to manage risk, then insurance really does have to be a kind of key component of that. And if you're not clear what cover you've got and how it all fits together and what things are covered and what are not, it's going to be more difficult for you to manage that risk for your organisation. And um, plan the renewal of your policies early this year. I, I know this sounds ridiculous, but everything seems to be more difficult as a result of the current crisis. Even simple things um, like the process that you go through each year to ask people within your organisation if they know of any claims that need to be notified to insurers, those processes are going to take longer. Um, this year. Insurers are understandably probably going to ask more questions, they're going to want um, more information and ultimately of course it, it's on you as organisations um, and you, your statutory duty when you're proposing to insurance to make sure that you give insurers a fair presentation of the risk. Now previously that might not have been too complicated because the overall risk profile to the business may not have changed dramatically year on year this year it may have changed significantly and again that's where your broker can really help you um, we mentioned claims made policies um, so it was just a reminder about the, the the importance of notification provisions if it's a claims made policy um, if you have a claim against the business or circumstances which are likely to give rise to a claim or may give rise to a claim then you know there is that obligation to notify early Actually, note, early notification really helps you as well. It means that your insurers are on board right from the start. It means that you can get help right from the start. Um, I hope it goes without saying, but never admit liability until you've spoken to your insurers. Um, that may affect cover under your policy if you do. And also speak to insurers before appointing your own lawyers. Um, some policies will give you uh, a chance uh, uh, of quite a wide choice of legal representation. Um, other insurers will be keen to use panel firms. Um, what you're really looking for is a firm that, that you know and you trust um, to give you really good quality advice, but obviously 
at the same time a lot of experience of working with insurers um, so that they can work hand in hand with you and ultimately the people who are paying the bills. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, go to questions now and stop sharing my screen. Wonderful. Let's see what questions we've got. Da, 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 da. Uh, let's take it from the bottom then. If there is an extension in BI cover for a notifiable disease occurring within the vicinity of the insured premises, how do you expect the vicinity wording to be interpreted? That's like the $50 million question that. Um, I've spoken to three barristers in the last week about precisely this. I've got three different views as to, um, uh, as to what the answer might be. M my personal view is I suspect that the courts will take a fairly narrow um, view when interpreting these policies. And I suspect, simply because BI policies are not necessarily designed to cover the kind of situation that's arisen here, so if I was a betting man, I'd say that that, that issue will probably be decided in insurer's favour. Um, but as I say, there is an incredibly broad range of very strongly held views out there. Um, uh, what else have we got? Does DNO insurance typically cover personal liability for directors? Yes, absolutely. Um, it does, yeah. Um, uh, covers personal liability for directors and it's probably even broader than that it normally covers you know other members of the board shadow directors it can even cover directors spouses and things like that so yes certainly does um, are you able to circulate the slides after the webinar yes of course we will um, I'm not sure how but we'll, we'll make sure that those are sent through to you which cover is best in terms of data protection breaches uh, that's an interesting one um, depending on your suite of policies, it might fall up under any number. The first one that I would go to to check is your DNO insurance. Okay, um, that's the most likely one to cover. Um, uh, and a couple by the looks of things for Andrew, uh, Mark O'Neill. Apologies if I've missed this, but what would be the position in relation to charities and those organisations that use volunteers? Are they covered under the insurance policy as they are not employees? In fact, that is probably one for me. That uh, sounds like an in employer's in uh, liability question. The answer is yes, most, most policies will cover volunteers and you know, even through to people who are on work experience and interns as, as well. But, but check the terms and conditions of your policy. Um, what else have we got? Because we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, one for Andrews regarding working from home. Oh, sorry, can an employer legally cut your pay without your consent or unilaterally? No. <laughs> um, sorry, I probably should give it a more sophisticated answer, but generally speaking, most employment contracts can only be varied by the consent of both parties. So it's unusual to have a clause which allows an employer to drop wages without consent. What I think is really important, as I said, is context. So in the initial outbreak, many employees agreed voluntarily pay cuts because of the grave impact of the pandemic and this kind of collegiate sense of we're all in it together. And I'm still seeing with some of the things that employers are doing right now, that willingness to agree temporary pay cuts to be present and allowing employers to achieve that without ending up in dispute. The real nub, and I keep coming back to this, is there is a limit to what employers and employees are gonna agree collectively together. And that limit will be reached depending on all of the decisions that you make. Because the, long, the thing I've said for all 20 years I've been an employment lawyer, is the way to avoid claims is to bring people with you. And you're not going to bring people with you if, for example, you're cutting pay, but you're not taking other steps that could have avoided addressing pay with your employees. You're not going to get people to voluntarily agree pay if you're also implementing large scale redundancies where you've not been transparent about why you're doing this. So there's a really important piece 
to, about demonstrating confidence in the decision making you're making as an organisation right now that will underpin your likelihood of getting tribunal litigation. Wonderful. A couple of quick ones to finish. Uh, can insurers require you to use your own lawyers? Uh, to Sorry, to use their lawyers? That's a question from Rachel. Um, it depends on the terms of the policy. Um, most policies and most insurers will give you a choice of panel insurers to pick from. Some insurers in some circumstances will um, uh, uh, allow you to instruct your choice of lawyer, um, but the extent to which those legal costs might be recoverable under the policy may be affected. So my advice, and of course I do have a vested interest here, is you know, look at the options that you've been given by insurers um, and look at the firms that they're recommending and probably in most cases um, that's the best route to go. And then finally, Hilary Charles regarding working from home, what are the employer's obligations in respect of ensuring that the employee is appropriately set up to work from home? Does the employer have any potential exposure under employment law and health and safety legislation? Um, well, Hilary, I, I'm not a casualty specialist, but my understanding is that, um, yeah, the employer's obligations, as I understand it, don't change simply because somebody is working from home. So it's exactly the same obligations on an employer to make sure that people have got the correct equipment and the correct setup um, to take all reasonably practicable steps to keep them safe from harm. So unfortunately, I suspect that is an area where we are likely to see arising claims. Um, but um, yeah, the, the employer's obligations remain exactly the same. Uh, Neil, uh, just one thing I could add to that is there are some useful guidance on home uh, working risk assessments available from the HSE. There's some useful input from ACAS on home working that's on their COVID response webpage. And I think it's a really great time for employers to start thinking about their obligations for remote working because it's inevitable that for many organisations that have worked remotely, that will become a permanent feature of your workplace. Wonderful. Um, we're going to leave it there. And uh, thank you very much, Jay, for the complimentary uh, comment on the Cortina's album poster in the background.